Councilman Bankson, we please lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> this evening, Council is appreciative to have Pastor Kennedy Amoko the Apost uh, of the Apostolic Church International here to pray with us. Pastor, thank you so much for being here. And welcome to Council. Thank you, Mr. President, and I'm so glad to be here. Shall we all close our eyes as we pray, commit ourselves into the hands of the Almighty God? Our dear God, creator of heaven and earth, we give praise and thanks to you for the gift of life and giving us the opportunity to enjoy what you have made. Father, we have made here as children who have been given an assignment. We pray and commit this meeting and this committee into your hands, O oh God. We ask for wisdom from heaven for the president and all the committee members who have met to talk about how to improve the life of the people that they serve. Father, it is you who governs from above. I pray that, oh God, your spirit will influence every member of this committee. That, Lord, their deliberations shall be for the good of the people. Father, we pray for safety for the city in which we live. We pray that, oh God, you'll bring an end to violence and you'll preserve life. We pray for the state of Ohio. We pray for the governors and all the leaders of the state. We also pray for our nation, USA. We are praying, O oh God, that you keep your people safe in this nation. We are praying that, O oh God, your blessings shall continue to live and abide with the people of Columbus. Father, we are asking that you will bless and continue to keep your people safe. Any violence that is going on in our neighborhood, we are praying that your hand will bring an end to the violence. We are also asking, O oh God, for the young ones in this city, the youth in this city. We are praying that, Lord, you give them purpose for life, that they will know you and also walk and do that which is right in your sight. This and many blessings we ask. In the name of your only son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting. Pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12, any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Are there any additions or corrections to the journal? Hearing none, the journal is approved. This week's communications received by the city clerk's office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the city bulletin. Are there any other communications to be read into the record? Not this time. We'll go around the dais uh, with announcements and resolutions, starting with Councilmember Bankston. Thank you, uh, President Harden. I have uh, one resolution this evening. Uh, I would like to introduce resolution 0103X-2023 to recognize the month of May as Jewish American Heritage Month in the city of Columbus. On April 20th, 2006, the federal government proclaimed May as Jewish American Heritage Month. And since then, this nation has celebrated the rich and diverse heritage of the Jewish American community annually. And I wholeheartedly believe that Columbus shares an obligation uh, to condemn and combat anti-Semitism wherever it exists and to stand with the Jewish American community against hatred or bigotry in our city and in this country. And so I'm proud to introduce uh, this resolution and to recognize May as Jewish Heritage, uh, Jewish American Heritage Month. Uh, we have Justin Shaw who is here with us. He's coming up to the podium. It's almost like we, like we planned that. <laughs> Uh, tonight in Chambers, we have uh, Justin Shaw accepting this resolution. He's the Senior Director of Community Relations for Jewish Columbus, and I'll turn the podium over to him at this time. Thank you very much, Council Member Bankston. Uh, good evening, Council President Harden and fellow Council Members. Um, on behalf of Jewish Columbus, I stand before you today with immense gratitude and profound appreciation as you pass a resolution recognizing and celebrating Jewish American Heritage Month. 
This important resolution honors the rich contributions made by Jewish Americans to the fabric of our nation and promotes understanding and appreciation of our culture and history. As we gather here, it is impossible to ignore the troubling reality of rising anti-Semitism. The resurgence of prejudice, discrimination, and hatred directed towards Jewish individuals is deeply concerning and demands our immediate attention. By acknowledging this issue, Columbus City Council sends a powerful message that we will not tolerate hate and that the bonds that unite us as a community are stronger than the divisions that seek to tear us apart. Earlier this year, Jewish Columbus joined the Foundation to Combat Anti-Semitism's national hashtag Stand Up to Jewish Hate campaign to raise awareness of anti-Semitism and hate targeting Jews and establish the blue square emoji already on most phones as a simple but powerful unifying symbol of solidarity and support for the Jewish community. We encourage people to show their support and solidarity by making their own networks aware of this campaign on social media. And for those who are a little less technological, you can also wear a blue square pen just like I have on. Jewish American Heritage Month serves as an important reminder that the story of Jewish Americans is interwoven into the fabric of our nation's history. It is a testament to the resilience, determination, and extraordinary contributions made by individuals of Jewish descent in all aspects of society, from arts, sciences, and business, to public service, social justice, and philanthropy. It is our responsibility to ensure that the struggles, achievements, and cultural heritage of Jewish Americans are not forgotten, but celebrated, shared, and cherished. By recognizing this month, we give ourselves the opportunity to learn, engage, and bridge the gaps of understanding, fo fostering a more inclusive and compassionate community. It serves as a reminder that we as Columbus value the contributions of all residents, regardless of background or faith. May this month serve as a powerful reminder that we are a community built on diversity, respect, and compassion. Together, let us continue work to work towards a future where every individual is valued, where differences are embraced, and where hatred has no place. Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you, Justin. And again, thank you to uh, the leadership at Jewish Columbus. Don't, I got to give you the resolution. Don't go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See, we didn't practice it. That, that, you guys, that was a joke. Um, but I want to thank you and Jewish Columbus for uh, all that you're doing in the community to raise awareness. And uh, we know that uh, hate crimes are on the rise across the board. And so this month is so important, not only about anti-Semitism and, and the hate uh, that we see in the Jewish community, but really all communities. And so we want to make sure that we highlight that this month, that we understand and stand up against hate, but also more importantly, that we celebrate the accomplishments uh, and the work that the Jewish American community uh, has done in this city and across this country. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for adoption. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Adopted. And that is all I have for announcements this evening. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Brown. Nothing this evening, sir. Press by Tim. Council Member Favor. Thank you, Council President Harden. Uh, tonight, just two announcements. On June 2nd at 8 p.m., the City of Columbus, in partnership with Moms Demand Action and the Mothers of Murdered Columbus Children, will host a Wear Orange Illumination Ceremony here at City Hall. Wear Orange Weekend originally began on June 2nd, 2015, to commemorate the 18th birthday of Hadaya Pendleton a black girl from Chicago who was shot and killed just a week after performing at President Obama's second inauguration. As we know all too well, gun violence is an epidemic, one that has and will continue to impact our lives. In Columbus alone, more than 1,300 people have been killed by gun violence, and in the past five years, 57 minors were killed in Columbus shootings. While we may not have a cooperative partner in establishing common sense gun safety laws at the State House. We at City Council are dedicated toward finding solutions that reduce gun violence within our communities. This includes legislation we passed in December of last year to prohibit the sale of high magazine rifles with the city and adds penalties for unsafe gun storage. We are also working with Columbus Public Health to provide gun lock boxes to community members, which will also be available at the illumination ceremony. This event will serve as a time of reflection and a moment for us to strengthen our resolve to continue our fight against gun violence within our communities. 
And one of my proudest accomplishments since joining council in 2019 is the creation of the Columbus Youth Council, a program for Columbus High School juniors and seniors to learn about the functions of local government while gaining invaluable leadership and teamwork skills. Selected students participate in several sessions dealing with topics such as the structure of city government, city housing and development, public safety, and much more. Sessions begin at 8 a.m. and end at 2 p.m. Meals and programs supplies are provided. With that being said, I'm excited to announce that applications to be a part of the 2023-2024 cohort are now live and can be found at www.columbus.gov CYC. All application materials will be tentatively due June 15th. I encourage you to share this program with any rising junior or senior at a Columbus City High School. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Remy. Thank you very much, Council President Harden. I have one resolution this evening. I would like to invite Dr. Robert Lowe and our other Division of Fire guests to the podium as I introduce Resolution 105X 2023 to recognize and designate May 21st through the 27th, 2023 as Emergency Medical Services Week in Columbus, Ohio. In April 6, 1969, Columbus began administering administering emergency medical services to residents through the development of the Columbus Heartmobile Program, a partnership between the Columbus Division of Fire and the Ohio State University. Emergency medical service providers perform a vital public service with over 1,500 members of the Columbus Division of Fire providing life-saving care to those in need 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The members of the Columbus Division of Fire are highly trained paramedics that have the most current training and state-of-the-art equipment so that they, may, they can manage any medical, emergency medical situation they may encounter. Columbus City Council recognizes the value, accomplishments, sacrifices, and selfless contributions of emergency medical service provider, services providers by designating Emergency Medical Services Week. Being in the company, of one of the first EMS professionals in our country, I do want to acknowledge and thank Councilmember Mitch Brown for his service and leadership in this space. Um, it's truly remarkable thank that uh, we we still get to share in decision making in this in this body. So, thank you very much. I would like to turn it over to Dr. Lowe for bringing and thank him for bringing this important discussion to Council this evening. Dr. Lowe, the floor is yours. Thank you. Councilmember Remy, President Hardin, and members of council, uh, on behalf of Fire Chief Happ, his executive staff, and all the members of the Columbus Division of Fire, we thank you for taking the time to support and acknowledge our work during EMS Week. One of the many reasons we recognize EMS Week is to pause for a moment of appreciation for thanks to and for our EMS providers and all they do in our community. With the great level of professionalism, readiness, and willingness to respond, we naturally sometimes take for granted their presence and vigilance in our daily lives. And so it is important that we pause during this week just to recognize uh, all that they do for our city. The men and women of the Columbus Division of Fire have taken an oath of service and protection for the residents of Columbus. In 2022, Columbus Fire responded to some 175,000 potential EMS, rescue, or life-threatening events. When our teams respond, they often have no idea what they're headed into, but they do know most likely it's someone's worst day. And they must put aside their own emotion and own uh, temporary life moments to uh, respond to you and your loved ones. However, it's truly a team effort. Our firefighters, our paramedics, our EMTs, our call takers, our dispatchers, and even our police officers, all striving for the best possible outcome. Not one of us could do it alone, and so as we celebrate EMS week, we celebrate all of our EMS responders. Columbus Fire has a number of highlights planned this week. Stay tuned for our social media for stories, uh, helpful information, opportunities to learn, and, and different events. In closing, we thank you again, Council, for your support and recognition. And to all the citizens of Columbus, if you see a firefighter, a paramedic, an EMT this week, please join me in telling them thank you. Well, we know that you run towards the, the crisis while many are running away, and none was more evident when we saw um, your... Um, EMS personnel running into a massive shooting and they were in they had um, 
bulletproof vests, but they were there to treat the wounded. And it just was reminding to me, you know, it was mindful to me the, the danger that they put themselves into without any type of consideration for their own lives. So we do thank you for that. Um, I do want to acknowledge that uh, IAFF President Steve Sines sent over a, a nice letter of recognition and thanking us for the proclamation. I do want to open it up to any of my colleagues for comment. Councilmember Brown. Thank you, Councilmember Remy. Again, uh, just to reiterate what has already been said, but to recognize that pre-hospital emergency medicine makes a difference. Um, we've got a number of homicides in the city of Columbus already, but those numbers would be exceedingly higher if not for the skill, the dedication, and the engagement of each and every one of you. And you need to know that this council appreciates and recognizes that by acknowledging EMS Week. And I specifically, uh, unfortunately, when Remy mentioned 1969, that's when I started in EMS a long, long time ago. Uh, I'm not really that old. Um, it's the awareness that uh, EMS, again, and all, everyone just needs to take a moment and think about the football player that played for the uh, New York, uh, for the Buffalo Bills, who collapsed on the field. And EMS made the difference. And in this particular council on the wall, right behind you, is an AED. And the council staff volunteered to participate in the training so they would know how to save a life. That makes all the difference in the world. And again, our significant appreciation for all the things you do. Dr. Lowe, you in particular, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Anyone else? Seeing none, I move for adoption. Bankston, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy, President Harden. Thank you, Council President. That is all I have this evening. Thank you, Council Member. Are there any comments from the City Attorney's Office, uh, clerks? Auditor, are there any requests by members of council for the removal of an ordinance or resolution from the consent portion of the agenda? Soon, hearing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading of titles of third day legislation? Is there a second? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Will the clerk now read into the record the ordinance number of third day legislation on tonight's agenda? Economic Development Committee Ordinances 1481, 1483, 1485 2023, Technology Committee Ordinance 1356 and 1359 2023, Public Service and Transportation Committee Ordinances 1291, 1361, 1403, 1405 2023, Neighborhoods and Immigrant, Refugee and Migrant Affairs Committee. Ordinance 1562-2023, Recreation and Parks Committee, Ordinances 1121-1407-1522-2023, Public Utilities Committee, Ordinances 1203, 1212, 1320, 1322, 1342, 1344, 1348, 1349, 1351, 1355, 1365, and 1430 2023, Workforce Development Committee, Ordinance 1395 2023, Criminal Justice and Judiciary Committee, Ordinances 1007-1009-1456-2023, Public Safety Committee, Ordinance 1333-2023, and Finance Committee, Ordinance 1393-2023. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We don't have any speaking on the first reading portion of the agenda. The following ordinance appear on our agenda as consent actions. Will the clerk now read those ordinance number into the record? Resolutions of Expression 102X, 104X, 106X-2023, Economic Development Committee Ordinance 1386-2023, Small and Minority Business Committee Ordinances 1338, 1362, 1476-2023, Technology Committee Ordinances 1215, 1301, 1542, 1546 2023, Public Service and Transportation Committee, Ordinances 1170, 1224, 1276, 1280, 
1379-2023, Recreation and Parks Committee Ordinance 1118-2023, Public Utilities Committee Ordinances 924, 1171, 1175, 1176, 1190, 1272, 1339, and 1474-2023, Building and Zoning Policy Committee Ordinance 1370-2023, Housing Committee Ordinances 1236, 1249-1274-2023, Criminal Justice and Judi Judiciary Committee Ordinance 468 and 545 2023, Health and Human Services Committee Ordinances 1225, 1229, and 1429 2023, Public Safety Committee Ordinance 1001 and 1189 2023, Environment Committee Ordinances 1450 and 1471 2023, Administration Committee Ordinances 1313 and 1565-2023 finance committee resolution 77x-2023 ordinances 1248 1269 1363 1381 1396 1449-1511-2023 and appointments from the mayor's office numbered a0136 and a0137-2023 Thank you, Madam Clerk. We have two speakers on the uh, consent portion of the agenda. First speaker to come before council is Mr. Nate Wilkins speaking um, in support of Housing Ordinance 1274. Welcome back to council, Mr. Wilkins. 1612 Arlington Avenue, Mr. Los Angeles Wilkins. Um, I got several questions. Um, 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 1274-2023. I'm going to speak of a couple of ideas for a 536 Walnut Street. The house was built in 1910. House is over 100 years old, two bedrooms, one bath. I believe this property has sit vacant since 1987 for $30,000. Then it sat vacant again for, I think, in 1993 for 3000 <clears throat> If the city is taking land banks and putting uh, other structures on them, I propose if there's a vacant house that sits in a land bank for more than several years, we want to idolize those lands for low-income housing, for multi-disability, or some entity for the homeless population. Today, this probably sits like this on the website today, that we look at this today. What a diamond in the rough here. You know, if we're gonna talk about jobs, the city's coming around bringing a lot of jobs, a lot of manufacturing jobs to the city of Ohio and also Lincoln County and also Johnstown. Why don't the city of Columbus do the same thing and bring construction jobs, architect jobs back into this community? You know, what we don't see is construction jobs when houses sit vacant and abandonment, along with commercial and vitalizing structures and retails and other things out here to the city of Ohio. The city of Columbus is a great opportunity to bring these houses back on the market, not um, high end uh, subsidy houses but low-income houses for the people that's on a fixed income for seniors or other people that's single mothers and fathers or people that's getting out of jail. So again, I would just like to have more clarification on this. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. Director, would you please follow up? There was a couple of specific um, questions that he had, and if we could get those answers um, to Mr. Wilkins, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Um, the next speaker that we have come for council is Mr. Joe Motil speaking against Ordinance 1565, that's 2023. Mr. Motil, welcome back to council. Good evening. Uh, Joe Motil, 167 West Cook Road, Columbus, Ohio, President Harden, Pro Tem Dorns, Member of City Council. This MOU is one more display of the inequality and disproportionate spending of taxpayer dollars for public safety by the mayor. And now he wants to pay officers double time instead of time and a half. We already have depleted, have a depleted police force due to the mayor's $20 million buyout of 100 officers 
Officers retiring early due to the mayor's lack of support for them and his inability to recruit enough qualified officers to properly maintain an adequate number of officers to protect our citizens, their property, and our neighborhoods. So because the mayor, who takes no responsibility for crime and homicides that have gotten out of control across the city and more recently in the short north, Ginther's short north developer and business associates who dictate his every move ordered him to provide an unwarranted and excessive law enforcement presence in the short north this past weekend. I personally spent about an hour down there experiencing it Friday evening. The overkill included motorcycles, horses, bikes, drones, canine units, and helicopters. The helicopter noise drew complaints from a majority of the residents in the short north. Some residents regarded the excessive presence of law enforcement as the appearance of a police state. And with, the Columbus, and with Columbus hosting the Conference of Mayors Convention at the neighboring convention center in two weeks, the mayor could ill afford the potential for national embarrassment if another shooting took place in the short north while visiting mayors and other conventioners from around the shop, country shopped, ate, and drank in the short north. He's more concerned about his image and the safety of Columbus residents. So the FOP, or any union negotiating team for that matter, knows when their bargaining partner, who happens to be the mayor in this case, is on the hot seat and his choices are limited and his hands are tied. So the FOP takes advantage of the situation and demanded double time because they can't get enough officers to work overtime for time and a half. How many officers will be getting off their eight hour shifts to take advantage of making roughly $100 an hour or more and possibly even doing it two days in a row, 16 hours each day? Is it safe for a police officer to work their eight hour shift along with eight hours of overtime? And is it safe for the public? Is this quote special city special or operation of 2023 going to help with the crime and gun violence in and around Sullivan Avenue on the hilltop, Cleveland Avenue in the Linden area, Parsons Avenue on the south side, and other neighborhoods that have been neglected for decades? And how is, that, how is it that abandoned cars that have sat on the streets in the hilltop, south side, and elsewhere for months and haven't been towed to the impound lot uh, be, uh, just last week it was said that the city uh, said the impound lots were full, yet 107 cars were towed from high, North High Street in the short north, and by some miracle, room was found for those 107 cars at an impound lot. Apparently, your zip code, median income level, political clout, and voter turnout determines a neighborhood's public safety resources and code ens enforcement action. And in closing, the fact that the food truck vendors were mandated to shut down at midnight and restaurants and bars were not shouldn't surprise anyone. The food truck vendors, many of whom are our minorities and immigrants, are blue collar working stiffs who have no political clout and are being used as scapegoats to, for the rising crime in the short north by Ginther. This is a perfect example of 21st century class warfare. Rather than pick on food vendors, there should be more consideration about the removal of liquor license from bars that have a history of trouble. Thank you very much for the extra time. Thank you, sir. Um, I don't know if you can speak to a council member or certainly someone from the director. The uh, gentleman was speaking towards a um, specific ordinance about a, a, a negotiated uh, resolution for FOP police officers that work overtime. Could somebody speak to what that is actually for? If not, I think Count Chair Remy. Good evening, uh, Council President Hardin, President Pro Tem Dorans, wonderful members of council. Uh, regarding the mechanics of why an, F, uh, an MOU was required. It was required because we were making a fundamental alteration to the contract. It's required any time that uh, the contract is amended. Regarding the specifics as to why that was done, which I think is the salient point that uh, Joe was trying to make, I defer to safety. Council Member Hardin, or Council President, can't remember. Council President Hardin. Uh, Council Members, <clears throat> the MOU, uh, will provide Chief Bryant the ability to direct special operations based on crime data, deploying uh, safety forces where they're most needed. For example, this weekend's uh, Operation Burnout in the short north. Um, I can go on if you wish and continue to describe the, the events from this weekend. It's up to you. Oh, no, 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 uh, not, I just want to make sure but that we were. Essentially, it allows the, the Chief of Police to uh, specifically address problems in certain areas with with uh, special operations units. Thank you. And just to further the point, it, this was a, a collaborative effort that we did last year with Rex and Parks. So these these officers will be deployed in our parks, special events where we have the arts festival, et cetera. 
which um, when there is a need that arises, they that, will have the opportunity to get resources in those areas. And so that's correct. very uh, happy to support the legislation. Thank yeah, you. that's correct. It's not specific to any particular area. It's uh, citywide. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments on the consent portion of the agenda? Hearing none, uh, may I have a motion to approve these items as as consent? Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Favor? Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes. We're going to pass with the noted uh, exceptions. We'll now proceed with the second reading of 30 day postponed in emergency legislation. The first committee to come before council is the Technology Committee, chaired by Councilmember Bankston. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Harden. Tonight in the Technology Committee, uh, for second reading, I have Ordinance 1545-2023 to authorize the Director of the Department of Technology to enter into a nonprofit service agreement with the Columbus College of Art and Design to provide summer programming services to authorize the expenditure of $51,700 from the Information Services Operating Fund and to declare an emergency. Uh, Council President, at this time, I would like to move to postpone this ordinance until the June 5th meeting by voice. Is there a second? second. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Favor? Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Postponed. Thank you, Council President. May I go back to page two of the agenda for a first read in the Economic <coughs> Development Committee? Please. Thank you. Tonight on page two in the Economic Development Committee for first reading, we have Ordinance 1481-2023 to accept the application of Repar Properties LLC and Concos Mark A and Concos Andrea L for the annexation of certain territories containing 7.80 plus or minus acres in Northwich Township. Uh, Council President, at this time I move to refer this ordinance back to committee. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Uh, I'll refer back to the committee. Uh, th <laughs> thank you. That is all I have in our committee this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next committee to come before council is the is the Public Service and Transportation Committee. Uh, in the absence of the chair, Councilmember Favor will chair that committee. Councilmember Favor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. Tonight in Public Service and Transportation, we have Ordinance 1388-2023 to authorize the City Auditor to appropriate $1.2 million within the Federal Transportation Grants Fund to authorize the City Attorney's Office to contract for professional services relative to the acquisition of fee simple tighter and lesser interest in and to property needed for the Arterial Street Rehabilitation Cassidy Avenue widening project to authorize the city attorney's office to negotiate with the property owners to acquire the additional rights of way necessary to complete this project to authorize the expenditure of up to 1.5 million from the federal transportation grants fund and the streets and highways bond fund and to declare an emergency. The project will consist of improvements to the Cassidy Avenue corridor from the city of Bexley corporation line to seventh Avenue. This is the first of multiple phases to reconstruct the Cassidy Avenue corridor with complete street improvements. The ordinance authorizes the city attorney's office to hire professional services and to negotiate with property owners to acquire the various property rights necessary to complete the project. The Department of Public <coughs> Service is currently finalizing construction plans and is prepared to authorize right-of-way acquisition pending passage of this funding legislation. Are there any questions or comments by my colleagues? Seeing none, I'd move for passage. Bankston, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1397-2023 to authorize the city attorney to file complaints in order to immediately appropriate and accept the remaining fees simple and lesser real estate necessary to timely complete the ADA ramp project's 2019 general engineering project to authorize the expenditure of $16,970 and to declare an emergency. This project consists of installing ADA curb ramps at various locations across the city. The city's acquisition of the real estate will help make, improve, or repair certain portions of the public right-of-way located within the city of Columbus, which will be open to the public without charge. Are there any questions or comments by my colleagues? Seeing none, move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. 
Bankston, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. That's all in the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next committee to come before our council is the uh, Neighborhoods, Immigrant, Refugee, and Migrant Affairs Committee. Uh, that committee is also chaired by Councilman Barosa de Padilla, but in her absence, uh, President Pro Tim will chair that committee. Councilman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. And the Neighborhoods Committee, we have Ordinance uh, 1424-2023 to authorize the Department of uh, neighborhoods to modify an existing agreement with the Neighborhoods Desi Design Center to authorize an appropriation of expenditure within the Neighborhood Initiative Subfund and declare an emergency. Uh, at this time, at the request of the Chair, I move to postpone this legislation to our next Council meeting on June 5th, uh, 2023, by a voice vote. Sir, Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Favor? Same. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Ordinance is postponed. Thank you. Um, next, we have Ordinance 1557 2023 to authorize the city clerk to enter into grant agreements with various organizations in support of summer youth engagement and employment programs, to authorize the appropriation transfer within the general fund, to authorize an appropriation with the neighborhood initiated subfund, and declare an emergency. In April 2023, the City of Columbus had an open and competitive application process to support funding for nonprofit organizations looking to establish or grow pro programs focusing on various areas, including education, arts, and the crafts, workforce development, and financial literacy. Uh, these areas are designed to provide safe, constructive venues for youth to learn, grow, and develop during summer months when school is out. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Public Safety Chair Remy to share more about these programs. Councilmember Remy. Thank you very much. Um, let me see here. It's my fault. Let's do something else. So that was loud. <laughs> that was really loud. Super excited about um, this piece of legislation. <laughs> We've been able to work with a number of agencies um, to to make sure that we have these summer youth engagement opportunities. And I'm um, looking forward to watching how this progresses. Um, we have been, had a meeting today to talk about some diversion programs and others that would enlighten kids on um, opportunities, job opportunities that are in the community. So we're very happy to support this legislation. And I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Remy. Just to underscore that point, this, these programs are designed to make sure that our young people in our community have you know, opportunities this summer um, to learn, grow, in its safe uh, environments, um, to make sure they have the opportunity to do all those things uh, with school being out. Uh, do any of my colleagues have any other questions or comments? Uh, Council President? Chair, I just want to uh, thank all the, all the folks who scored all of these uh, proposals, the different departments that worked them, city council, neighborhoods, Rec and Parks, um, the mayor's office. Um, this is part of that $20 million package that we talked about last week. Um, um, it is our hope that every young person in this city this uh, summer has the opportunity to do something that will enrich their lives, um, keep them employed, um, and in, in the end, keep them uh, on a productive pathway so that we can all have a safe and prosperous summer. Um, we know that prevention works. Uh, as a part of a safety strategy, and there's no better way to prevent than to keep our young people engaged um, in uh, productive uh, programming. And so it is just our hope that uh, to all the parents, to all the aunts and uncles out there, to all the mentors, to all the teachers, to all the coaches, uh, if you're looking for something for your young person or a young person that you know uh, to do this summer, uh, please know that the City of Columbus is um, supporting um, these organizations and that there should be spots available for your young person. So um, we'll, we'll also work to make sure that we're getting as much information out so you can find out how to connect with uh, these different organizations. But very proud of this funding and this is just one component of our neighborhood safety strategy. So I appreciate the support of this, this body. Thank you, Council President. Uh, any other questions or comments from, from members? Uh, seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Torrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Passed. 
Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1582-2023 to authorize the transfer and expenditure of up to $1,262,650 uh, within the Department of Neighborhoods to authorize the Director of Department of Neighbors to enter a subrecipient grant agreements with Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Ohio, Inc., Child Development Council of Franklin County, Columbus Fashion Initiative doing business as Columbus Fashion Alliance, Legacy Youth uh, Academy and African American well Male Wellness Walk doing business as National African American well Male Wellness Agency in the amount of $1,262,650 to add needed capacity to address COVID-19 specific services for boys and young men of color and black girls to authorize the payment of expenses starting May 16, 2023 and declared emergency. Um, this legislation is important to provide funding for summer programming and internships. Thank you, sir. Um, both initiatives prioritize education and employment experiences that not only support youth economically, but also provide safe environments that may deter young folks from engaging in behaviors that could negatively impact their future. Uh, emergency action is being requested to ensure that students can benefit from summer employment opportunities as soon as possible. Uh, again, this legislation is building on these initiatives to make sure that our young folks have an opportunity uh, to learn, grow, um, and earn a living this summer safely. Uh, and my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1585 2023 to authorize the Director of the Department of Neighborhoods to enter grant agreements with the following not for profit agencies in support of summer youth employment and programs. Always be with us, charities, such as Community House, um, Columbus Metropolitan Library, Columbus Development of Caring Foundation, uh, uh, Community Refugee and Immigration Services, Goldman Guild Association, Heart. Uh, Job Foundation, uh, Highland Youth Garden, Ice Mentors, Inc., Kingdom First, New Birth Christian Ministries, Ohio Black Dance Organization, Our Brothers Keepers, Somali Community Association of Ohio, Think Make Live Youth, YMCA of Central Ohio, YWCA of Columbus, and to authorize a transfer within the general fund to authorize an expenditure within the general fund and declared emergency. Uh, similar to the previous ordinances, uh, this legislation provides service agreements with previously listed nonprofit agencies for the purpose of providing youth summer employment and programming. Do I make colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Hart. Passed. Thank you, Council President. I will pass it back to you for the next committee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Next committee coming before Council is the Recreation and Parks Committee, chaired by Councilmember Brown. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. This evening I have one ordinance in Recreation and Parks. Um, Ordinance 1521-2023 to authorize the Director of Recreation and Parks to enter grant agreements with various nonprofit organizations in support of summer programming to youth, to authorize the transfer of $1,500,000 within the Recreation and Parks Operating Fund, to authorize the appropriation of $320,678 into the Recreation and Parks Operating Fund from the unappropriate balance in the Recreation and Parks Operating Fund and to authorize an expenditure within the Recreation and Parks Operating Fund and to declare an emergency. This ordinance authorized the awarding of $1,527,093 in summer programming funds to grants to the following 501c3 nonprofit organizations. All the teens hope for about tomorrow, Asian American Community Services, Boys and Girls Clubs of Central Ohio, Bridging Our Communities Together for Success, Capital Equity Exquarian Inc., the Community for New Directions, Directions for Youth and Families, Eckerd Youth Alternative, Engage Central Ohio, Femergy, Marcello Columbus LLC, NCBC Human Services Corporation, Project Redeem Inc., Somalia Community Link, Southside Hope CDC, St. Vincent Family Services, The Buckeye Ranch Inc., Charles Madison Neighborhood Memorial Garden, the Cordillon, Cordillon Performing Arts Academy, and Trades of Faith. These grant awards will be used to expand quality summer programs for youth residing within the city's geographic boundaries. Funding will support nonprofit 501c3 organizations looking to establish or grow programs focused on education, arts and crafts, workforce development, financial literacy, and more. The term of these grant agreements will begin June 1st, 2023, and will end on December 31st, 2023. I have with me tonight Don Turnage, the Assistant Director from the Recreation and Parks Department, who oversees youth development sections to tell us more about the review process. Assistant Director. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you President Harden and, and all of Council. Um, 
we are super excited and, and elated to be part of this um, emergency funding for us to go ahead and um, grant the expansion of uh, any summer programming that our youth will be participating in throughout our geographical area. And it will go beyond just um, simply working. Workforce development as well as literacy and financial development will also be there. Um, the application process that started in April, on a, in April 4th, I do believe, it, until April 25th, was an extensive process that did include a lot of great organizations. And um, coming through with the nonprofit 501c3 organizations and the services they provide, we will be extending our our services that we have been working with them continuously through our youth development division, um, as well as employment through our, our app stop readiness program and some of those youth and working together in collaboration. Um, so with that said, thank you very much and we look forward to a successful summer as we continue to um, bond together and, and tackle those concerns that we have throughout our community. Uh, Mr. Director, approximately how many students or young people are we talking about for the numbers? Um, for our job readiness program, yes. we have 240 youth that will be starting work on June the 5th. They've already been to a uh, meet and greet process and actually have also started some orientation processing as well. Thank you. Are there any questions from my colleagues? Great. Seeing none, I move for passage. Thanks. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Dorans, favor. Remy, President Harden. Pass. That's all I have, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next committee to come before council is the Public Utilities Committee, chaired by President Pro Tem. President Pro Tem, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. Tonight in Public Utilities, we have Ordinance 0725 2023 to authorize amendment to the 2022 Capital Improvement Budget to offer, authorize the appropriation transfer of funds from the Water Su Systems Reserve Fund to the Water Supply Revolving Loan. Uh, account fund to authorize a director of public utilities to enter a construction contract with JDL Construction Services the, for the Brixham Road Area Water Line Improvement Project to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of up to $3,956,043 from the Water Supply Revolving Loan uh, Account Fund uh, for the contract and authorize expenditure of up to $2,000 from the Water Bond Fund to pay for prevailing wage services for the project. Uh, the work for this project consists of the replacement of almost 9,000 linear feet of water mains, which have exceeded their useful life, and construction of new lines to eliminate, eliminate poor fire flow capabilities and poor water quality in the hilltop planning area. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Brown, Dorans, favor. Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 0906-2023 to amend the 2022 Capital Improvement Budget to authorize the transfer of cash and appropriation within the Water Bond Fund um, to authorize the appropriation of funds within the Water Re Revolving Loan uh, Loan Fund to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into a construction contract with PAWP Hydrochloric Disinfectant Project with Cocosin Industrial and to authorize the expansion of up to $24,267,000 from the Water Revolving Loan uh, Fund and the Water Bond Fund to pay for a contract for preventing wage administration. Uh, this project will address the current risks associated with the gaseous chlorine-based system while providing a safer storage and handling uh, system for plant staff. Do I have any colleagues have questions or comments? See none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1183-2023 to authorize an amendment to the 2022 Capital Improvement Budget to authorize the appropriation and transfer of funds from the Sanitary Sewer Reserve Fund, Sanitary Revolving Loan uh, Fund, to, the, uh, to authorize the appropriation of funds within the Sanitary Revolving Loan Fund, to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter a construction contract with Danburg, Inc., for the Blueprint Hilltop Palmetto Westgate Integrated Solutions Project to authorize the expenditure of up to $7,113,031.96 from the Sanitary Revolving Loan Fund to the, the Sanitary General Obligation Fund to pay for the project and to authorize a ma maximum amount of loan to fund the construction of this project be increased. Um, this project will capture and treat non-point source storm runoff in order to improve water quality within the receiving streams. Uh, do my colleagues have questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1206-2023 to authorize an amendment to the 2022 Capital Improvement Budget to authorize a transfer of cash within the Sanitary General Obligation Bond Fund to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into construction modification with Prime AE Group for the Intermodal Sanitary Subtrunk Extension Project to expend up to $1,065,568.19 from the Sanitary General Obligation Fund to pay for the project and declare an emergency. Uh, this project will provide improvements and repairs to the compost facility process, 
order control and electrical systems. Do I have my colleagues any questions or comments? Seeing none, and move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Torrance, Faber, Remy, President Hart. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1270-2023 to authorize amendment to the 2022 capital improvement budget to authorize the transfer of cash between projects within the Water Paygo Fund to authorize the appropriation of funds within the Water Revolving Loan Fund within the Water Paygo Fund to authorize a waiver of competitive bidding requirements for construction to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into a professional services and construction services contract with Cigaro Central for the water treatment re residuals turnkey dewatering de services project and to authorize the expenditure of up to 40, 47 million from the um, Water Revolving Loan Fund and the Water Paygo Fund for the contract. As part of the drinking water treatment process, several water treatment residual products are generated that require hauling, management, and beneficial reuse or disposal. This project will design and construct a water treatment residual dewatering facility in the Division of Waters McKinley Avenue Quarry uh, property that will move away from this disposal-based operation to one that is entirely sustainable based upon beneficial use for our city. Um, do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1297 2023 to authorize amendment to the 2022 capital improvement budget to authorize the appropriation and transfer of, uh, of funds from the Sanitary Preserve Fund to the Ohio Water Development Authority Loan Fund to authorize the Director of the Department of Public Utilities to enter into construction contract with Brown and Caldwell for the Southerly Wastewater Treatment Plan. Organics receiving a bioenergy utilization facility project to authorize the appropriation of an expenditure of up to $21,224,775.42 from the Ohio Water Development Authority loan fund for the contract and declare an emergency. Um, this project was created by combining the cogeneration uh, digester expansion phase three project and the fats, oils, and grease in high strength organic waste receiving station project at the Southerly Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, these projects were combined, accelerated in order to take advantage of the, of the Inflation Reduction Act re rebate program. Um, under the current guidelines provided by the IRS, this project is eligible for up to 50% rebate on the total construction costs and will save the City of Columbus up to $70 million on the construction of the facilities that were already in our capital budget. In addition, the IR rebates, this project will be eligible for additional funding from grants due to greenhouse gas re reductions, elect electrical usage reduction, and diversion from landfills. From an environmental perspective, this project will reduce cellularly wastewater treatment plants greenhouse gas footprint by capturing methane from the digesters and divert food and other organic waste from the Swaco landfill to the cellularly wastewater treatment plant for biogas and power production. Um, do I have my colleagues some questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you, Council President. All I have at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next committee to come before Council. Is the Safety Committee. Chaired by Councilman Remy. Councilman Flores yours. Thank you very much, Council President. I have a few ordinances this evening in public yeah. safety. Um, our... Um, First ordinance is 976 2023 to authorize the finance management director on behalf of the Department of Public Safety to enter into contracts with an issue purchase orders to Horton emergency vehicles for the purchase of two EMS transport vehicles in the amount of $717,216. Stryker Sales Corporation for the purchase of EMS Lucas compression devices and power cots and loaders in the amount of $444,206.22. And Motorola Solutions Inc. for radio communications equipment in the amount of $184,111.13 to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Codes to authorize the expenditure of $1,345,533.35 from the Safety General Obligation Bond Fund and to declare an emergency. The Division of Fire has an immediate need to purchase two EMS transport vehicles from Horton emergency vehicles to replace medics that have been removed from service. The Division of Fire also has an e a need to replace striker EMS equipment, including Lucas compression devices and power load cots loaders to equip the new medics. In addition to this EMS apparatus and equipment, the Division of Fire needs to purchase radio communication equipment from Motorola Solutions Inc. to replace aging equipment used in emergency response. Assistant Director Bob Stewart, could you just speak to the waiver of competitive bidding, please? Yes, sir. Essentially, this is a, 
a universal bid contract, uh, a universal term contract, <clears throat> in that all of this equipment uh, specifically replaces equipment that needs to be replaced and for new equipment that needs to be purchased. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Bankston, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Hart. <coughs> Next, I have Ordinance 1163-2023 to repeal Ordinances 0118-2023 and 790-2023 to authorize the Director of the Department of Public Safety to enter into a new contract with Change Healthcare Practice Management Solutions, Inc. for EMS billing, collection, and reporting services for the Division of Fire to waive the competitive bidding provisions of City Code to authorize the expenditure of $1,500,000 from the General Fund and to declare an emergency. Public safety contracts the services of Change Healthcare for billing, collection, and reporting of those who are transported by, to hospitals by EMS personnel, personnel for emergency medical care. These billing, collection, and reporting services have generated a multitude of patient care information used by the fire division to better prepare EMS response protocols and, in turn, respond to citizens in a more effective manner. The division also generates reports for various fire organizations that are cataloged nationwide. Revenue generated since the inception of the program in 2002 resulted, amounted to over $270 million at the end of December 2022 and is deposited in the city's general fund. Assistant Director, could you speak to the waiver of competitive bidding on this particular piece? Yes, sir. Change Healthcare uh, has proven to be a qualified and reliable contractor in managing EMS billing and reporting services at this time. The bid waiver is needed because the Department of Public Safety is not, is not seeking an alternate contractor. Uh, the city attorney has also requested repeal of two previous ordinances uh, at the approval of one due to uh, the original ordinance not specifying dates of the contract. Thank you very much, Assistant Director. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Next, I have Ordinance 1188-2023 to authorize an appropriation of $2,850,016.38 from the unappropriate appropriated balance of the Law Enforcement Contraband Seizure Fund to the Division of Police to fund travel and training needs and purchase equipment, supplies, and services. This ordinance authorizes an appropriation of $2,850,016.38 from the unappropriated balance of the Federal and State Law Enforcement Contraband Seizure Fund for the Division of Police. Funds were received from seized and forfeited property and are used solely for law enforcement purposes as specified in Ordinance 1850-85. These funds are used to purchase various services, supplies, and equipment. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing that, I move for passage. Second. Bankston, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Next, I have Ordinance 1352-2023 to authorize the Director of the Department of Public Safety to enter into contract with Street Smart Rentals, LLC in order to rent temporary lights and security camera systems for deployment in city parks to authorize the transfer of $550,000 within the general fund for, from the Department of Finance's citywide account to the Department of Public Safety to authorize the expenditure of $550,000 from the general fund to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code and to declare an emergency. Due to incidents of violence in parks, the City of Columbus entered into an agreement last year with Street Smart Rental Services to install temporary and portable lights and camera systems in city parks that are of concern to the community and the Division of Police. This ordinance is to enter into a second year of continued monitoring of selected Columbus parks. These lights and camera systems will continue to be to enhance the police's ability to actively monitor the parks. If a violent incident occurs in one of the identified locations, these cameras will assist in the apprehension of suspects. 25 locations for initial deployment were identified by the Division of Police and Recreation and Parks Department, utilizing the latest crime data, as well as intelligence from patrol officers and neighborhood residents. These systems are mobile, allowing the division to relocate them to the area of greatest need. Assistant Director, could you speak to the waiver competitive bidding on this one? Yes, sir. The bid waiver is due to the immediate availability <clears throat> of the vendor. The Street Smart Rentals are having the contract last year for the rental of the trailers, the cameras, and the deploy for the deployment in the city uh, parks. Public safety requests continuance of this rental uh, in two 2023 for the immediate deployment of the equipment. 
Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Bankston, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Next, I have ordinance 1512 2023 to authorize the city attorney to enter into two contracts with Lindsay Automotive Inc. and Mr. Transmission Milex Complete Auto Care for the purpose of supporting and expanding the Project Tail Light Public Safety and Crime Prevention Pilot to authorize an appropriation of $175,000 within the Reimagined Safety Sub Fund to authorize a transfer appropriation and expenditure within the Public Safety Initiatives sub fund to waive the competitive bidding requirements of the Columbus City Code and to declare an emergency. In 2021, Columbus City Attorney Zach Klein partnered with the Columbus Division of Police, the Franklin County Board of Commissioners, Columbus State Community College, and local auto repair shops to pilot Project Taillight, an innovative public safety and crime prevention program. Project Taillight aims to improve community safety and trust by connecting low-income residents with free headlight, taillight, brake light, license plate light, and or turn signal repairs, keeping everyone safer on the road and avoiding fees for citations and tickets. Participants also receive free vehicle inspections and fluid top-off services. I was excited to join um, C City Attorney Klein in the efforts to bring this to fruition and add the additional funding. Um, we're looking forward to serving a wider swath of people and um, a little bit more about the program is that community residents from households with income less than 200% of the federal poverty level are eligible for free repairs. Columbus Police, community liaison officers, the Department of Neighborhoods and nonprofit partners spread the word about the program, then refer interested residents to the city attorney's community outreach team. The city attorney outreach team screens for eligibility, then connects eligible drivers to Project Taillight Auto Partners for repair services. During the first portion of the pilot, it became apparent during the vehicle inspections that many of the vehicles brought in for repairs had issues affecting them other than just safety lights and that, that there would be difficulty for residents to afford these additional repairs. Columbus City Council is partnering with the city attorney's office to make funds available to assist with these repairs to keep these auto automobiles operational and allow residents to maintain their transportation. Assistant City Attorney Laura Baker Morris, could you speak to the bid waiver in this ordinance and share any other details about this program? Thank Please. you, Council Member Remy. I uh, really appreciate this on behalf of City Attorney Klein's office, the opportunity to partner with Council to continue the Project Tail Light program. Um, as you indicated, this is a pilot program, and it is the hope of the City Attorney's office that if Council continues to support it, that we'll be expanding the program in 2024 and we'll open it up for a bid on that approved Project Tail Light repair uh, for repair vendors. At this point in time, we would like to request a bid waiver in order to allow us to continue to work with vetted project repair partners as we continue to finalize the project uh, criteria um, for expanding the pilot program to include the expanded services that were already mentioned. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, Assistant City Attorney. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing that, I move for passage. Second. Bankston, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. And finally, I have Ordinance 1553-2023 to authorize the Director of the Department of Public Safety to enter into contract with Next Star Broadcasting, DBA, WCMH, in support of the Love Our Children, Lock Your Guns Safety Initiative to authorize an appropriation of $25,000 within the Jobs Growth Subfund to authorize a transfer of $25,000 within the General Fund to authorize an appropriation and expenditure of $50,000 within the Public Safety Initiative Subfund to waive the competitive bidding requirements of this Columbus City Codes and to declare an emergency. Love Our Children, Lock Your Guns is a council initiative that is beginning its community-wide education and marketing campaign on the importance of gun safety and protecting our city's children from harm. Council, in partnership with WCMH, will develop the wider message, platform, and resources to reach residents throughout Columbus, including a special focus on uh, parents and households with children. WCMH designed a three-month partnership that involves live television, online presence, and targeted streaming on their platform. It will collaborate in producing public service announcements, advertisements, and work on strategic public event presence. This will include information about gun locks with an interactive map showing all gun lock pickup locations and a schedule of events where gun locks will be available for distribution. The state may try to take away our rights to rule in our city, but I will say that we are not going to stop 
until we get the message of safety out here. So I'm very excited to partner with Council Member Brown on this particular initiative to make sure that we are getting the word out to tell people to lock their guns, but also provide them with the, re with the resources to do so. So I am particularly excited to partner with you, Council Member. Would like to give you the opportunity to speak on this particular initiative. Thank you, Council Member Remy. Uh, again, I think from a societal standpoint, we need to be aware of the fact that gun violence is significant. And a lot of it deals with the fact that people are not paying attention. By providing them with gun locks, this phrase, love our children, lock your guns. How is simple, easy to understand, not complicated, and even to the point that we're going to give away gun locks. You'll be able to get them through our fire division, different locations, so that people will understand the importance. We talked about EMS week earlier when we had the firefighters here. There's nothing worse than seeing a child that has been shot. And I have seen that, and it is the most unpleasant thing one could ever experience. So the consequences of that are such that if we can provide people with a mechanism of getting a free gun lock, then you are being very, very successful. We, we're going to purchase as many as we possibly can. We're going to do a safety initiative in conjunction with Councilmember Remy. And we want people to be aware of the fact that it is inexcusable. It is inexcusable to have a weapon and not just secure it properly. So this council, in agreement with all of my council colleagues, acknowledge that this is something that we're going to initiate and we're going to make happen. And just to further elaborate, Councilman Remy, if I may, we have Assistant Director Stewart speak to the number of guns that were collected just this weekend. Council uh, Director? Council Member Brown. Sorry, it's a loud night. Council Member Brown, President Hardin, President Pro Tem Doran, City Council. This weekend, CBD deployed Operation Burnout in this uh, short north in response to back to back weekends of out of control violence in the area. The event was a clear success. No violence in the short north, no homicides citywide. Multiple residents in the area approached officers and offered their support and appreciation for their efforts throughout the weekend. Operation Burnout will not be just again this weekend, as I indicated before, but will also be applied citywide. Some of the stats, there were 224 traffic citations issued, 31 misdemeanor citations, one juvenile arrest, four misdemeanor arrests, seven felony arrests, eight arrests on warrants, seven firearms recovered, four incidents of drugs seized, and 229 parking citations issued. Councilman Remy and President Hardin, just the realization, just this weekend, seven guns recovered. Again, what is wrong with us? As a society, what is wrong with us? And so this program of Love Our Children, Lock Your Guns is the initiative that this council is taking up in conjunction with Councilman Remy, and I am honored to be a part of it. So thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Councilmember. Um, with all the efforts, I know um, Councilmember Favor is working on gun boxes and others. Uh, you know, there's, there's no excuse for not locking your guns, and certainly keep your guns out of your cars. That's been a multitude of problems as we've seen crime rise. So looking forward to the support. Um, are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing that I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. <clears throat> Bankston, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Passed. And before we finalize everything, I know, um, thank you, Assistant Director. I don't know, did Deputy Chief Ali, did you want to come up and speak to anything uh, this weekend? Or are you, you all good? I know we um, had a successful weekend, but I thought maybe you might be able to speak a little bit to President that. Hardin, council members, thank you so much for your time. Uh, the Division of Police would just like to thank City Council for your support. And we are very proud of the work that was done by police officers, not only with the Division of Police, but also by members of the other divisions uh, throughout the city. There was a lot of cooperation that took place, and there was a lot of working in conjunction with city employees and the public and business members 
in order to have the successes that took place. Uh, as was talked about, uh, there were a lot of guns taken off the street. There were arrests made. And this is just the beginning of further actions uh, that will take place as the summer goes on. Uh, this operation burnout that took place over this weekend took place in the short north this time, but that's the beauty of the operation. It can take place any place in the city of Columbus, and we look forward to continuing the operation with the support of city council and members of the city. Thank you so much for your time. That's great. Thank you very much, Deputy Chief. And that is all I have on my committees this evening. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. The final committee to come before council is the Rules and Reference Committee. Tonight, I'm going to um, bring forth Ordinance 1525-2023 is to ordain the executive order 2023-01 of the mayor ordering directing ordering and directing the director of the department of public service and director of the department of public safety within their respective jur jurisdictions under columbus city codes to prohibit mobile food vending operations in the short north after 11:59 p.m on friday saturday and sunday evenings and declare an emer emergency uh, as folks know, um, there were a series of violence and incidents in the short north, and I appreciate uh, Deputy Chief Ali being here and speaking to the work that was done. What I think is really important that Deputy Chief spoke about is even though we had a specific task and we messaged a specific operation to the short north last weekend and this weekend, that this effort of public safety, increased public safety of focused enforcement is something that can and will be taken and used in, in every neighborhood of this community. Um, it was a request by the mayor and by safety officials to, as we clear out the short north, uh, as we work to chill the short north for these last couple of weekends, that one of the things that slows folks from leaving an area is like we all do, we hang out around the food trucks. And as we ask the bars and restaurants to close at midnight, um, and as we ask folks to exit the short north at midnight, one of the things that would help expedite that is by having the food vendors pull back uh, at that time as well. Um, these measures are meant to be temor temporary. We will ensure that they are temporary. Uh, we also do not believe in scapegoating uh, the uh, food truck vendor or food vendors. We don't believe that they are the uh, uh, impetus of the violence, or nor should they be blamed for it. Um, but as we ask the entire community to step up, have skin in the game and keeping us all safe in this targeted short term um, temporary initiative, we are asking, I'm asking my colleagues to support the, this effort uh, in, this, in this limited um, time period um, to, to uh, continue to enforce uh, this executive order. Um, are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Sure, the chair or council member Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, President Harden. Um, I, I really, you know, as chair of small minority business committee, I really wanted to make sure uh, that we underscored that this is not about uh, singling out uh, our food vendors uh, or singling out any particular small business, uh, that it is a, a concerted effort but we know that uh, with that, there will be pain from our small uh, businesses, particularly our food vendors. Uh, but we know that if we don't meet this moment, there could be even more significant pain and that we won't have a thriving entertainment district for them to operate in. Um, and so we are trying to do all we can to meet this moment. But more importantly, I want to lift up that uh, we are doing everything that we can as a city uh, to address violence. We know that it is not food trucks. We know that it is not simply uh, bars. We have to get at the root cause in this community if we really truly want to address it long term. So this is a short term fix because we are responding to a crisis situation, but it is not at all in any means a long term uh, strategy. Uh, but we know what that strategy is. What does it look like? Like tonight, investing in more lights and cameras in our parks and additional enforcement that you'll see over the summer. It's expanding shot spotter on the hilltop so that we can better respond to gun violence. It's increased investment in unprecedented alternative response services and units that this council has been committed to. 
It's over $20 million invested in our youth over the summer to make sure that they are invested in and they have hope. It's the creation of an Office of Violence Prevention to figure out how we coordinate better as a city to address the violence that is here, but the violence that we know is going to come with the growing pains of a growing city. It's rearranging our policing zones by using data to make sure that we are able to address crime more effectively. And it's historic gun legislation passed by our chair, uh, Favor, who worked to get that across the finish line. So we're doing what we can do at the city level. But be clear, we don't regulate uh, liquor. Mm -hmm. We don't regulate guns. That is two blocks up the street. And so I say to folks, continue to push on us to make sure that we are going to do what we can to keep the city safe. But if we're going to address the root causes, it means that we also have to take that fight to the state house, to have them get out of the way of home rule and allow cities to do what is best for their people. And so although this ordinance tonight, may, we may be talking about simply uh, closing food vendors until midnight, it is a much bigger issue for us. And what I will say to the food vending community and to the small business community in particular, you have a commitment from me to make sure that we work over these next two weeks that this is brought back before this council on June 2nd to revisit it. And what I mean by that is us analyzing to make sure that what we are doing is working uh, and to ensure that we create an environment that is safe, uh, not only for those that are going to the bars, but also safe for our food vendors and their operations. To think about the violence that took place and bullets flying everywhere, they too were in harm's way. So this is not just simply about our resident safety, it's also about our small businesses' safety. It's about our economic safety as a community. Uh, and so uh, this is a difficult vote because we know that Again, small businesses and blue collar folks in particular will be hurt, uh, but it is a sacrifice that all of us as a community are making to ensure uh, that Columbus, all of Columbus, is a safe and thriving community. Uh, so thank you, Council President, for allowing me a chance to, to speak directly to our small businesses. Uh, and I would again say uh, to everyone, no greater police presence, no strong legislation, none of that alone is going to fix our problem. We are not going to police our way out of this. We're not going to program our way out of this. It is going to take all of us as a community locking arms to say that this is not who we are as a community. And so check to see where your kids are mm -hmm. at 10 p.m. There is no reason that 13, 14, 16 year olds have any business down in the short north or any district that is serving alcohol. This is a community effort, and it's going to take all of us uh, to move the city forward and to keep us safe. So, uh, again, this is uh, a tough vote for us. But, again, as the chair of small business committed to making sure uh, that uh, we are monitoring this on a weekly basis and ensure that we bring this back before this council uh, to, for reconsideration. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council Member. And I just want to also, you know, we're – putting this focus on food trucks, but again, this is a much larger uh, strategy. This is one small component of it. Um, we don't make policy ad hoc. We don't make a policy um, uh, off the cuff. In fact, I want to uh, acknowledge and thank Chair Remy, who ran a multi-month process having this conversation specifically with small businesses, with food, vendor, food truck vendors, uh, food cart vendors in the short north and got us to the policy that we just enacted a couple months ago. Um, we look forward to going back there because in this city you can also go out, have fun, be out at 2.30 a.m. and still be safe. Um, and that's what we look forward to getting back to uh, very soon. Um, so with that, um, we have a speaker on this ordinance, uh, Mr. Kareem Ali. Is Mr. Ali here? Mr. Ali, welcome to council. President Harding, Kritim Doran, City Council members. My name is Karim Ali. I'm a 24 year resident of Columbus, Ohio. 22 years have been in the short north. 
Um, I don't represent um, any food service uh, vendors. Um, uh, thanks to the adventures of my three-year-old son, I'm usually in bed by um, 11 o'clock, so I don't frequent any of these places. Um, I rise to share a concern about what I believe is the inequity in this legislation for four reasons. I believe there's a failure uh, of due process. I believe there's a failure of an overly broad restriction. I believe, I believe the mayor has provided limited evidence. I believe this council has provided limited evidence to support this very broad initiative. I also question whether there are more simpler targeted alternatives to this effort. With respect to due process, the 14th Amendment of the United States guarantees us the right under the Constitution to due process. Due process involves notice, fair hearing, and an opportunity to be heard. I don't own any of these small businesses, but I do not believe, unlike the example that you mentioned a moment ago, I don't think any of these businesses were given the opportunity to be heard about closing down. Notice, when I learned of Mayor Ginther's executive order requiring all mobile food operators to cease operations by midnight, my first thought was the unfairness of it. There are a good number of small businesses that are eking out uh, a profession, um, and effectively, we are shutting down their businesses. My question is, well, what is city council doing to support them in this one week period that you're claiming, or two week period? I heard anyone talk about potential funding for these small business owners. No fair hearing. Small businesses are the lifeblood of this city. It is unfair if you can come and do this now to this set of small businesses, that you can't do it to some other small business. Overly broad. The Short North is a very large neighborhood. It's composed of Harrison West, Victorian Village, Italian Village, The Circles, Denison Avenue. My question is, it's my understanding that this effort only happened in a small area. Why are we targeting the entire Short North? There's no evidence that these vendors are the source. And if there is, my question to council, why don't you share with us what data that you reviewed in order to make this decision? It sounds really good to be able to decide anecdotally, well, there are crowds, and therefore crowds cause problems. My question is, well, what are we doing despite uh, what evidence we have to make these decisions? These are life-changing decisions that you're making. You're asking these small businesses to trust you because you know what you're doing, but you've given no support for your decision. I recognize my time has elapsed. I asked if I can continue for one more minute. You said you had three points or four points? Yes. Uh, one more minute, please. Thank you. In addition to, I recognize it's very difficult to make these decisions, and I don't envy the position that you're in. In terms of alternatives, I ask, what are the possible alternatives? There is a huge area in the short north between High Street on Goodell and Park, vacant, which actually could be an area used for food trucks, could be monitored. It's not an area of congestion. What are we actually thinking about in terms of the other opportunities for this legislation? I ask that council pause on this legislation and take a moment to think, are there, are there, have we explored all the alternatives? And finally, I've been in this city for 24 years. My three-year-old son would like to tell you one thing. The midnight marathon helicopter rides are very distracting. It is what makes people like me, who are lifelong residents of this city, decide to move to Bexley in Dublin. I know this is not an easy job, but living in a war zone is not a fun feeling. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions or comments? Again, I, 
want to stress this is a temporary effort that uh, is to support and to keep our community safe um, and that we look forward to uh, re revisiting this. City Attorney, and then there was something that was brought up and I think the City Attorney wanted to. Thank you, Council President Please. Hardin. I did want to address some specific concerns that were raised and make sure that there's clarity on what is and what is not contained within this particular piece of, leg of legislation and the executive order. Um, specifically, what is before Council today and what the Mayor executed as an executive order late earlier this uh, past weekend is a decision to order the Department Directors of Public Service and Public Safety to consider the in, within the congestion zone that's within the Short North, which is a very specific and defined area within the Short North and not all of the Short North, but is a specific area where previously the Department of Public Service had indicated that food carts could be located. All of these food carts are located within the city's right of way. There, this is an existing power that the Department of Director of Public Service has to make a determination as to whether or not a food cart in a specific location does or does not constitute a public threat to either health or safety. And given what had happened over the last couple of weeks related to areas in which food carts were located on the city streets in the city right of way, the determination was made that keeping them there after a certain hour would be a danger to public safety. It's really important to note that there was no deprivation of due process here because there was no shutting down of the business. It was specifically that food carts could not be located in that particular location. The food cart could sell their food in another location. The food cart never, uh, owners never lost the ability to sell with their food carts. What they lost and said was the ability to sell in that particular location at a particular time for a very limited particular time. So I just wanted to make it clear that at no point in time did the city revoke anybody's license or prohibit them from engaging in a business in any way, shape, or form. Instead, what we did was we exercised the power that was already within city code to determine that at that point in time, that particular location would not be available. And I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you, Madam City Attorney. If there are no other questions or comments, uh, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy, President Harden. Um, resolved. See no further business come for counsel. Is there a motion to adjourn? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy, President Harden. The meeting is adjourned.
Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Thanks. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Dorans, Remy, President Harden. Are there any additions or corrections to the journal? Hearing none, the journal is approved. Uh, we will now go to the zoning committee. Councilmember Doran's chairs that committee. All members serve on it. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. Allow me to, as always, briefly explain our current rules pertaining to speaking before council on rezonings and variances. We will only hear a staff presentation for ordinances that have a disapproval from a recommend recommending body or if we have a public speaker signed up to speak against an ordinance. Uh, this evening, we have five public speaker slips. Uh, all speakers and council variances, including city staff, air commission, applicants, and members of the public, will be sworn in before they give testimony. Representatives of an area commission and applicants are always able to speak on an ordinance and do not need to fill out a speaker slip. On the advice of the city attorney's office, I will now swear in city staff. Please stand and raise your right hand and be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer the pains or penalty of perjury? If so, please say I do. Thank you. Uh, please let the record reflect that Joseph Rose from the Department of Building and Zoning Services and Dan Bleschmidt from the Department of Public Service have been sworn in. Um, first, we have Ordinance 1378 to amend Ordinance Number 2366-2020, passed October 3rd, 2022, for private located at 5050 Riggins Road by repealing Section 3 and replacing it with the new Section 3, thereby modifying the building size and locations on site plan. The applicant's Cardinal Self Storage LLC, care, care of uh, Jill Tangeman, attorney, proposed to use a self storage facility. Seas Department recommendation is approval. Hayden Run Civic Association recommendation is also approval. Uh, do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Bankston, Brown, Dorans, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 2882-2021 to rezone 2510 Bethel Road, being 1.06 plus acres located north side of Bethel Road, 1600 plus feet east of Solomon Road from CPD Commercial Plan Development District to CPD Commercial Plan Development District. The applicant is uh, 2510 Bethel Road, LLC. Uh, care of David Honduras. The proposed use is a car wash. The department recommendation is approval. Uh, development Commission recommendation is approval. Northwest Civic Association recommendation is disapproval. Um, because of that disapproval, before we get to our public speakers, we'll have Mr. Rose give a presentation. Uh, Mr. Rose, the floor is yours. The site now parcel of a shopping center developed by the former bank in the CPD commercial plan development district. The applicant requests the CPD commercial plan development district to permit an automatic car wash. Development text commits to a site plan and landscape plan and includes development standards and includes development standards addressing setbacks, access, building design, and graphics provisions. Modifications to code standards to not provide an exclusive bypass lane and to have the dumpster located on the northeast corner of the property rather than behind the principal building are included in this request. This site is subject to the Bethel Road Regional Commercial Overlay and is located within the boundaries of the Northwest Plan which recommends mixed use one uses at this location, including commercial uses. The plan also recommends that parking lots should be provided to the rear of the buildings and that all parking lots visible from roadways should have adequate screening. The requested CPD commercial plan development district will allow an automatic car wash development that is compatible with adjacent commercial development and includes additional landscaping, screening, and street trees consistent with the parking and screening recommendations of the Northwest plan. Therefore, city's recommendation is for approval, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Rose. And my colleagues have any questions to the department at this time? Seeing none, I will move in to our public speakers. Uh, I will call them in the order that we receive the, their speaker slips. Uh, just to note that we also receive written testimony both in support and against this legislation, which has been provided to all council offices at this point. Uh, first, we'll hear from Mr. Uh, Jeff Baldwin speaking in favor of the ordinance. Mr. Baldwin? Welcome to council, sir. Uh, please state your name and any relationship you have to the property, and you have three minutes, sir. Hello. Hello. Jeffrey Baldwin. I'm with Donato's Pizza. We're the adjacent property to the west of this corner property, which is located at uh, the Donato's Pizza is 2522 Bethel Road. Um, obviously, it's in the same carriage place plaza. I'm here to extend our full support for the proposed car wash to be developed at the former PNC Bank location, which is, uh, as I said, directly adjacent to the Donato's Pizza. Donato's uh, has served the surrounding neighborhoods from this location for over 20 years. Donato's is a neighborhood business and Carriage Place is a neighborhood retail shopping center. The proposed car wash redevelopment aligns with the existing retail businesses and should attract area residents as a convenience who already shop at Carriage Place rather than, in our opinion, causing an increase in overall traffic. 
The new development will add energy to the center and fulfill a need in the community. As business owners, we welcome that excitement and we look forward to the redevelopment as proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baldwin. Do I have any colleagues have any questions for Mr. Baldwin? Seeing them, thank you for being here tonight. Um, the next speaker we have uh, to come before council is Mr. Nicholas Lacalay, speaking in support of the ordinance. Welcome to council. Uh, please state your name and any relationship you, ha you have with the property, and you have three men, sir. Um, good evening. Uh, Nicholas Lacolade. I'm the proposed tenant operator uh, of the use. Um, Trilogy CWS doing business is Turbo Wash. Um, so my family's been doing business in Central Ohio for over 100 years. Prior to founding Turbo Wash a few years ago, um, I uh, operated and ran uh, Certified Oil, which uh, was founded in 1939, where we had over 600 um, amazing employees in Central Ohio. And um, we sold that business in 2019. Um, and I've moved to um, a new form of retail, which is um, you know, the Express Tunnel Car Wash. And uh, I built my first site up in Polaris, which, is, which opened in January of 22. I built my second site uh, on Easton, in Easton on Morse Road opened in January this past year. I'm breaking ground on my third in Canal Winchester, and this, this site would be, if approved, my, my fourth site. Um, the motto of Turbo Wash is cleaner, faster, better. Um, it's the best wash in town, given um, the technology and the inside, the length of the tunnel, and the, um, the, the equipment that we use. Uh, it's a better experience with the three pay lanes, which facilitates speed and ease. Um, and uh, it's, it's, as I said, it's faster. So um, I've looked at all of Central Ohio markets and I've worked with Skilk and Gold to identify um, sites within markets that I like. And um, I think that this Bethel Corridor is in, you know, in the beginning stage of a renaissance and I'm excited to be a part of, um, of the area. Yep. Thank you. Any questions from my colleagues at this time? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next uh, speaker we have to speak up against the ordinance is Mr. Randy Boyce. Mr. Boyce, welcome to council. As you've heard, please state your name and any relationship with you have with the property, and you have three minutes, sir. Good evening. Uh, my name is Randy Boyce, and I live uh, right across the street from the building that is proposed to be torn down to build a car wash. Uh, I've lived there for 27 years. Um, the name of the community is Bethel Village Condominium Association. We have 500 different homeowners uh, or units in our community. And in the 27 years that I've lived in Bethel Village, um, not much has changed. Uh, the shopping center that's right across the street has always had the following type of occupants. We've had restaurants, we've had stores, we've had grocery stores, we've had a movie theater. And sure, the names on some of these businesses change. But, you know, when I first moved in, it was Big Bear. And then it became Walmart. And the point that I'm trying to make is the, the nature of the businesses hasn't changed, right? And in 27 years of living there, nothing has changed. Uh, we still have the same road widths, we still have the same uh, limited parking in the shopping center. Um, my front door is still the same distance from the building that used to be a bank for many, many, many years. And my point is that we have zoning laws for a reason, and I would encourage each of you to, to, to recognize the fact that zoning laws are designed to protect people in their residential um, habitats and I would ask you to vote against uh, rezoning this to a car wash. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boyce. Any questions from my colleagues from Mr. Boyce? Thank you. See you Thank you. Uh, the next speaker we have to come before us uh, speaking against the ordinance is Mr. David Corey. Mr. Corey. Mr. Corey, uh, please state your name, any relationship you have to the property, and you have three minutes. My name is David Corey, and I live right across the street from the proposed uh, car wash. Um, I would also encourage the, board, uh, the council to deny the variance. 
Uh, they are planning to have vacuums that it's our understanding will be going 24 seven and that will increase the amount of noise drastically. Further, the traffic situation is going to be negatively impacted by having lots of cars stacking up in front of uh, this car wash, which is on a very, very small site for what it is. Um, either the cars will spill out onto Pickford and interfere with the Coda buses, or they will block the access to the businesses, which for the first time in, you know, that I've lived there in three years, every single one of these storefronts is actually occupied and in business. Um, so I think that the, you know, the, the renaissance that somebody mentioned earlier would absolutely have the brakes put on uh, by a car wash because we already have almost full occupancy. There just doesn't seem to be a reason uh, for this type of business that is going to negatively impact the businesses we have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Um, the next speaker, uh, last public speaker to speak on this ordinance is Ms. Monica Tuttle. Ms. Tuttle? Thank you. Uh, please state your name, any relationship you have with the property, and you have three minutes. Good evening. My name is Monica Tuttle, and I am a resident of the Northwest community. I'm also the zoning chair for the Northwest Civic Organization. And I come before you tonight as a member of the community and also representing my other members of my community. I did submit some written uh, comments to uh, City Council prior to tonight's meeting, and I'm sure that you've had an opportunity to review those, but I'd like to just focus on three main points. This car wash is not an appropriate use for the current or future conditions at this location. As you're all aware, Link Us is a huge endeavor, a multi-agency endeavor, and the Northwest Corridor runs adjacent to this proposed rezoning. This parcel would be directly on the same street where we are trying to encourage bus rapid transit and improved pedestrian connectivity. A car wash, unfortunately, does not have any pedestrian-friendly or rider-friendly services to offer. Aside from shopping for a car wash, there's nothing else that a, a pedestrian would use this site for, should this site go forward. Um, additionally, this parcel is located adjacent to multiple neighborhoods. The Northwest plan recommends mixed use one at this site, and that's appropriate for this residential commercial area. An automatic car wash does not com contribute to the blend of commercial and residential that we are looking for in this area. Secondly, and most importantly, even if rezoning this to allow for a C5 use, such as a car wash, which I understand is the only C5 use they are requesting, even if that were appropriate for this location, the site plan is non-tenable. I'd request that it be be brought up before you, you probably all have it in front of you, but in order to utilize this site, a driver would have to make three consecutive U-turns to move through the stacking lanes, the car wash, and then to exit from this parcel. This is a small, almost landlocked parcel. Additionally, in order to exit that site, the cars departing from the car wash would be facing on the cars departing from the vacuums would be facing the oncoming cars coming out of the car wash and both trying to exit through a 17-foot curb cut. That curb cut is not far distant from the entryway into the overall shopping plaza. Unfortunately, the, the traffic and the movement of cars through this site just does not allow for this use to function. Additionally, they're requesting that a bypass lane not be required, which means that should any of those 21 cars that are stacked up to move through the car wash decide that they no longer wish to wait in line, they have nothing, they have no other option other than to back out of that site into the overall shopping plaza. Finally, we've had numerous meetings with the applicant and at no time has there been any um, intentional discussion of trying to modify the site plan to address any of the community's concerns. The applicant has been adamant. Meg, you may finish. The applicant. The applicant has been adamant that if she is not able to move forward with the proposed um, rezoning, that she will be forced to rent to startups or less desirable tenants. Those are not my words. 
This is a this is a neighborhood with diverse neighbor. This is a community with diverse neighborhoods with a number of local businesses, and we are adamant that um, the the fabric of our neighbor, the fabric of our community should be maintained, and we strenuously implore you to oppose the CPD as proposed at this time. We would look forward to working with the applicant to see if there were some other tenable solution that would be more appropriate for the site. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tuttle. Uh, any questions from my colleagues at this time? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we next would invite the applicant, uh, Ms. Linda Honduras, to make any remarks um, at this time. Good evening. So since you're the applicant, uh, you're able to speak without the, the three minutes. So if you want to make any presentations or respond to any specific comments from any of the public speakers, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, next to me is Dave Saar. Uh, he's our CEO of our company. So good evening, everyone. Appreciate the opportunity, council members and <coughs> President Harden, for allowing me to speak this evening. I'm the owner of a 33 year old commercial building that's located in a Walmart par parking lot. Um, since acquiring the property in 2016, we've only had one tenant, and it was the PNC Bank, and they opted out to not renew, and that lease ended in 2021. My building has been vacant for almost two years while we've looked for a new tenant with a proven track record of success, good credit history, and who is willing to pay a fair price for our space. To date, we've only found one prospect who meets that criteria. You met him earlier, Nick, who would like to build a turbo wash car wash. We want to be good stewards of the neighborhood and understand that the Northwest Civic Association would like to have a walkable community designation on the property. So they mentioned to me a library. I reached out to the Columbus Metropolitan Library System and was told that another library location had been selected, and that's at the Ohio State Sheep Farm, and our location would not be considered because they had already decided on the other location. We have planned the new site around the association's concern for pedestrian safety and have granted easement access for a future bike lane and for widening the sidewalk around the property. We wanted to understand the type of businesses that the neighborhood would welcome, so we walked the Pickford Commons community, I did that back in November and December, in advance of the first, my first Northwest Civic Association I knocked on the doors in hopes to explain to neighbors what we were going to do. I also, again in April, we mailed letters to the neighboring properties, and just last week we surveyed local residents. I have 21 letters of support that I've brought with me this evening to the meeting. We have tried to be good stewards of this process. Additionally, we've reached out to every business owner in Carriage Place and have received their support for our proposed tenant. We have engaged two separate real estate companies to market the property to ensure that our first real estate company did not miss any opportunity to find a qualified tenant. As is possible with any vacant building, we have experienced just recently theft, water damage, and have become a resting place for the unhoused. I respectfully ask for a change in zoning so we can move forward with this new build that will enhance and refresh the Carriage Place Center and help to protect the, protect, protect the investment I have made as a property owner doing business in the Northwest Civic Association area. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Linda. Any questions or comments from council members at this time? Councilmember Bankston. Um, I just, I'm, and I'm over here looking at the site plan now. I think it was mentioned by one of the speakers that there's only one ingress and egress. It looks like there's two. So I don't know who can speak to that. Are there actually two different ways in? There, there are. Okay. And to be more specific, I let Dave. Maybe come up. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind being at the mic. Um, the furthest northwest entrance is an entrance only. 
and the uh, the northeast is an exit only. Okay. And they call. So it's it's three three lanes. So three three, three exact cars. There is they call it the chicken lane in the car wash world, where it's just coned off. So if someone got up and they didn't like the price or they didn't feel like they were, they were claustrophobic or whatnot, then we can open that and they can exit it. So there is kind of a, a flush out. They don't need to go through the tunnel. To okay. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. In, any other questions from council members at this time? I, I have a couple questions for the departments just to sort of clarify. So, Mr. Pleshman, so uh, I think a couple of the folks that testified here were, again, their primary concerns were around sort of traffic-related issues um, regarding this, this development. Um, so this, this project does not necessitate a traffic study or anything like that. If you could speak to sort of the level of analysis that the Department of Public Service takes and then approves for site plans like this, I think there were some, again, some specific questions around how this type of parcel would be appropriate given the, the constraints of its size, configuration, et cetera. Uh, again, that is part of the analysis that the city does when they, when they re review the use. And I wanted to know if you could walk um, you know, this body sort of through that analysis because the Department of Public Service ultimately approve the project sure uh, definitely uh, president council members of council chair Dorns uh, this site did not require a traffic impact study um, that those are typically reserved for larger sites that uh, would have a certain trip threshold uh, this this would be lower than that um, and it also did not require traffic access study typically those are um, <clears throat> required when there's uh, going to be um, improvements within the public right-of-way like a turn lane or a traffic signal so so that level analysis was not required however what we do review the site plan and, and the internal access and circulation is something that we we look at and that was that was a comment we had made on the initial uh, review of this uh, as um, may be evident the uh, uh, there was an existing entrance excuse me exit lane on the site and we had actually asked them to move that further to the uh, west to provide additional stacking space um, so um, uh, you know looking at the circulation there it was um, uh, adequate for for our review and our approval of the the site plan and given that it's currently a shopping center which has you know significant um, sort of transportation um, infrastructure there because it's a shopping center people are coming and going on a regular basis that would sort of lend to the credence of like the uh, congestion is not going to be necessarily disruptive uh, considering what is already currently there correct that's correct it, it'd be unlikely that it would be um, significant thank you and mr. Rose you mentioned earlier that one of the levels of analysis for looking at um, other businesses within the area and that this was um, not out of line with those can, those uses nearby correct yeah correct basically the previous CPD text approved all four C4 uses with the exception of what was in the text this approves all C4 uses with those same exceptions but includes the C5 uses which would include the car wash uh, it's based that from the plan this being similar uses of what was there already zoned that this is also appropriate and staff was willing to support this site as, pre as presented. Any questions from members of the departments? Councilman Brown. Yeah, um, so in the winter, we operate from 8 till uh, 7 at night. And then in the summer, in the lighter months, we operate till eight, till eight. Till when? So it's not 24 eight to eight. Eight, eight to eight, eight, eight in, the, in the longer, uh, when the days get longer. And in the winter months, when, it's, when they're shorter, it's uh, eight to seven. So it's not 24 it's hours. It's not 24 seven. And we turn our vacuum, I mean, that's a ton of energy. We would never run those uh, 24 seven. Okay. Not 24 Thank you, Council Member. Okay. Any other questions from Council Members at this time? So uh, thank you to the applicants. I um, want to say thank you for everyone who took the time to come down to testify tonight. Um, this is certainly one that, you know, has been with council for a number of uh, months, if not close to a year at this point. Um, so this analysis of this was not done lightly. Um, you know, we worked with the department, certainly. My staff communicated with folks in the community. 
the, you know, the idea that nothing is ever going to change in Columbus with the city that is growing right now is just not the reality that we live in. Um, you know, this council has a record of voting with our Air Commission Civic Associations 95% of the time. And I think that's because of that collaboration that exists with these groups. Um, but unfortunately, this is, you know, just an instance in which this is an out parcel of a Walmart and a shopping center. And this does seem to be an appropriate use, in my opinion, given the, um, you know, the adjo adjoining businesses and, and certainly the area that it's located in. So um, at this time, if there are no other questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Dorrance, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Ordinance 1402-2023 to grant advance provisions of Section 33.09, uh, 3309.14, height districts, 3312.25, maneuvering, 3312.29, parking spaces, 3312.49C, minimum number of parking spaces required, 3333.15C, base of the computing areas, 3333.18, building lines, 3333.24, rear yard of Columbus City Coast, with property located at 1205 Chesapeake Avenue, permit reduced development standards in the AR3 apartment residential district, and repeal ordinance number 3016-2021, passed December 13, 2021. The applicant's preferred living uh, care of David Hodge attorney proposes a multi-unit residential development. City's department recommendation is approval. The 5th by Northwest Area Commission's recommendation is also approval. I first move to accept the entire set report into evidence as an exhibit. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Brown, Dorans, Remy, President Harden. Uh, accept it. Next, I move to adopt the fines of staff, the fines of council. Clerk, Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Dorrance, Remy, President Harden. And finally, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Dorrance, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you, Council President. That's all I have on tonight's agenda. See no further business coming for Council. Is there a motion to adjourn? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Brown, Dorrance, Remy, President Harden. Adjourn.